You're listening to Cloud9, where BahaiTeachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. Over the course of 100 years, roughly 150,000 Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their homes and communities across Canada. They were placed in government and religiously funded boarding schools known as residential schools. This was done in an effort to assimilate them into Euro-Canadian culture and disrupt the transfer of language, traditional practice, storytelling, and history across multiple generations. Louise Prophet LeBlanc was one of these children sent from the Nacho Neakdan First Nation in the Northern Yukon Territory of Canada. She first discovered the Baha'i faith after her grandmother advised her to seek for two medicine men who were foretold by her tradition would unite all the peoples of the world. In her youth, Louise recognized these two men to be the Bab and Baha'u'llah, the forerunner and founder of the Baha'i faith. Today, Louise is an internationally renowned traditional storyteller, poet, and multidisciplinary artist who's now based in Wakefield, Quebec. She has spent her life dedicated to the promotion and development of Indigenous art across Canada. For many years, she fostered the creative pursuits of young Indigenous artists through her work on the Canada Council for the Arts. Over the past two decades, Louise has devoted her creative and professional life to the promotion and preservation of Indigenous stories and honouring those of residential school survivors in the efforts towards reconciliation. Louise, thank you so much for joining us on Cloud9. Oh, thank you, Shadi. Now let's start with your childhood in the Yukon. This is where you were raised and where you spent most of your life. Could you paint a picture for our listeners of what it was like to grow up there? The village where I'm from is a traditional um, landmass. Uh, the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation have been camped along, along its shores for years and years, probably centuries. I'm not sure how long. I just know that when they dig up old stuff out of the ground, the archaeologists do so that they've uh, occupied that area for at least a thousand years. So uh, there's a beautiful river there, which they renamed the Stewart River, but it's actually called by my people the Nacho, which means big river. And uh, so that's, that's where I was raised up, beside this river. I think one of my favorite memories, of course, is living with my grandmother. I lived with her off and on throughout my life until she passed when I was about 12 years old. And that was always a favorite thing. Um, we lived through, I guess, what they refer to as subsistence living, which means that we were hunters and gatherers and fisher people, as well as, you know, buying our, our food at the stores. So that's called subsistence living. And so it was always, you know, we, we were always near the river or swimming in it. Um, there's a lot of camping, boating, hunting. So that was kind of the cycle of our lives until I went to school, of course, and I had to uh, enter a residential school system. Now, as we mentioned earlier, residential schools existed in Canada for roughly 100 years and were established to essentially assimilate Indigenous children into Euro-Canadian culture. Families were separated from their children for years and countless abuses and deaths occurred during this time. Children were disconnected from their families and communities in an effort to eliminate Indigenous culture and practice from colonial Canada. However, Louise, you are considered as one of the fortunate few who were able to leave. And once your grandmother recognized what was going on, she removed you from the school. Yeah, exactly. When I was there for, I think it was grade two and three, and it was a Catholic residential school. And I said, all they, I said, what they teach me there is just about Mary. And she said, oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> but my grandmother really wanted me to be educated, like spiritually. So she looked around and saw that as maybe a means to educate me spiritually. So 
maybe she knew something about me that I didn't know in those days. And of course, her mind was changed when she realized what was going on there. The residential school when I was very little was run, as I said, by the Catholic uh, diocese of that of White Horse in the Yukon. And it was run by uh, the nuns and the priests. And so on the girls' side, it was strictly run by the nuns. And, um, you know, the children were not encouraged to speak their language. In fact, they were discouraged. And uh, we were always... Uh, very leery of these women that walked around in long black robes and this kind of uh, white thing around their around their heads. We could never see their hair. You know, if you told the line and if you did exactly what they said that you're supposed to do and go to mass every day and ask for forgiveness and things like this, and we weren't sure what we had done wrong, but we were supposed to ask for forgiveness. And I think when my grandmother discovered that, she said, that's she said, children don't sin. You know, that was such a beautiful moment for me when I, when my grandmother told me that. She said, they can't say you're bad, you're a child. Your grandmother was extremely influential in your life. She introduced you to the art of storytelling and also the concept of prayer. Could you share some of those early memories of your grandmother and how she accompanied you to discover the Baha'i faith? Well, you know, she had all of her friends. All of her friends uh, used to come over and they were friends that spoke different languages. But my grandmother was multilingual. She understood Northwest Territories language and two or three of the indigenous languages of the Yukon and a little bit of French. And so her friends would come over and they would share stories and she would share these stories with me. But certainly from the time I was very young, she, she, she taught me that it was very important that in order for me to maintain a balanced life, that one of the things I'd have to do is to pray every day. And she said, you know, well, the first time I realized that she was praying as I was staying at her house and my little bed was just next door to her little bedroom and I could hear her talking in there. So as a child, you know, I was very curious and I... Who's she talking to? Exactly. I thought, who's she talking to? So I kind of peeked into her room and she was sitting on her bed and she was... I could see she was talking, but she had her head down and her eyes were closed. And so later on when she came out, I said, Grandma, who are you talking to? She said, oh, Tauringi. And that means the creator of everything. He who makes everything, she said. And that's when she taught me the practice. She said, when you get up in the morning, she said, you have to say good morning and you have to talk to Otaudingi and tell him, ask him to help you have a good day and to do good things for people. And then at the end of the day, she said, you got to say thank you. You got to say thank you for helping you to do the things you're supposed to do and one the things that you weren't able to do, then you have to tell them to help you the next day. So, you know, she was really preparing me, you know, for that, for that uh, discipline of saying prayers every day to be conscious of there is a God and that this God is, is a loving God and he's watching you and he's helping you. And she also talked to me. Uh, I know that this was later when I was preteen. And she really frightened me, actually, because during that time was the Cold War and, you know, there was this always this fear of nuclear blasts and the whole world is going to go poof. And she said, you know, in the time of the end, she said, you know, two powerful medicine men are going to come to the world. And I was always intrigued by these stories, for sure. She said, and when they come, she said, all the people are going to come together together. She said, you know, China man, black man, white man, and us too. She said, all the Indian people were going to come under one big tent, she said, in the time of the end. And she always would tell me, you watch for them. She said, one one medicine man, he's more powerful than the other one. She said, you watch for them too. What they say, she said, you have to do that. So, of course, when I was later on in my, in my uh, growing up years, you know, when I was a pre, pre-youth and around 11 years old, this is when I, I discovered down um, from a woman who moved into our community with her family. Uh, she was Shirley Lindstrom. She's my spiritual teacher. And she told me about the Bob and Baha'u'llah. 
And these were the the two medicine men that she'd yeah. been referring to. That's amazing. I knew right away. Wow. Now, I know your art is heavily influenced by the writings of Baha'u'llah, in particular, the hidden yes. words in the Seven yes. Valleys. When were you first introduced to them and how did this impact you as an early Baha'i? A very good friend of mine who used to serve on the National Assembly of the Baha'is of Canada, he he knew that I, I was very intrigued by poetry. He said, I hear that you like poetry. I said, I sure do. And he said, well, I'll give you this little book here. He said, it's like poetry. So he gave me the little booklet of uh, hidden words and I read it. And a couple of weeks later, I saw it. He said, sir, are you enjoying that little book of poetry? I said, wow, he, is that guy ever a, bo- a poet? <laughs> As you're to Baha'u'llah, wow, I felt so embarrassed later on. I, I read them in a little sweat lodge that I had made for my children and myself. So every day before we would go into that little sweat lodge, I would sit outside and I would say, okay, we're going to read one of these every day. And when we go in there, we'll think about what it means. So my youngest was about five years old at that time. And the other two were seven and eight years old. And we'd sit in there and have a little sweat and we would reflect on those hidden words. That's such a beautiful memory. Now, You've already kind of touched on this, but I'm really curious to learn about the intersection between your identity as an Indigenous woman and as a Baha'i. What were some of the commonalities and how were you able to integrate your Indigenous beliefs and practices into your new faith? Well, you know, I I, I just don't see and I have never seen, you know, and that's from the teachings of my of my grandparents and my aunties, you know, that the world is just one family. Everything around us has been created by one creator and that religion is one. You know, I I know that my grandmother told me this one story when I was a small child. She said, you know, everybody's going up the same mountain. She said, we're going back home. She said, we all go up the same mountain. We just take a different trail. She said, it's not up to us to tell people you know which trail to take we got to all go up the same mountain so I really put that into my heart and I tried to practice you know just acknowledging people's belief and um, I was curious of course I was curious about other religions I think that that religiosity I suppose my grandmother planted that seed in my heart in my mind uh, and to always acknowledge that so growing up Near to nature, I suppose, I could see some of the miracles of nature every day. I recognize that, you know, like, like my grandmother used to always say, like referring to some of the stories, you know, when there was a hunting season, she used to always say to me, now you have to feed that little bird. Do you see that little bird there? It's a little camp robber. She said, you feed him. You hear what he's saying? He said, give me meat. Feed me, give me meat, feed me. She said, that's a hunter bird. So when you feed him, he's going to go and he's going to bring moose to the hunters. You see how we all get along here? She said, this is how we can get along. And she always stressed to me the importance of trying to be your very best, the best you could be and, and to work with other people. She said, don't talk bad about other people because you're supposed to try and help them. So those were principles, you know, that I learned when I was very little. And um, in learning these, these ways of life, um, I, when I became a Baha'i, it was just uh, another chapter, I suppose, or another grade, if I was in grade school, that I was going up another level in terms of my understanding why I'm here. Even the idea of the native beliefs, you know, an indigenous belief system that when you leave this world, you go into a new world and a new life. It's a spirit world. So you continue your life, your spirit or your soul. You know, we refer to it in our language as our spirit, that which grows with us all our life. And then we we head off to the next spiritual world. So those things are, are I, I don't see any division. I also do not see any division. I'm, I'm a Baha'i who struggles every day to be a Baha'i. And I think that within the native spirituality, everybody struggles every day to be a spiritual being, you know, to remember 
that we're all here together. And the more we get together and the more we're in unity, we will survive. That was the principle that we learned when we were children, that if everybody's paddling the same way, <laughs> probably we have a better chance of going faster and better. And uh, so that was for our survival. But we always called on the, always called on the creator, you know, to help us and to acknowledge every day that, you know, we're just a puny little form, but, you know, with uh, the creator's power, anything is possible. Mm. So that's how I grew up. And so, you know, transitioning, I suppose, was just moving, moving on this trajectory. Evolution. It's an evolution. That's the word. It was an evolution of, you know, my being since I was trained as a child and moving into it. And then um, also, you know, seeking a truth, you know, what my grandmother was talking about. I looked everywhere for it, but I didn't see it. And I didn't really understand it until I was much older that there has to be an evolution. There has to be more spirituality. unfolded I suppose or unbundled to the world in order for this world to get stronger and to come together in that unity yes and it's amazing that as humans we're always searching for answers and Baha'u'llah's teaching of the personal search and investigation for truth is an incredibly liberating one that honors us as noble beings now To recap, we've spoken about your early life in the Yukon, your experiences at residential school, your grandmother's wisdom and influence on your spiritual life, and your introduction to the Baha'i faith. I'd like to now move into your work as a multidisciplinary artist. How have the teachings of Baha'u'llah directly influenced your work as an artist? And what are some aspects of the faith that you are inspired by? Prior to my uh, embracing the Baha'i faith, prior to recognizing the truth and Baha'u'llah's teachings and being given this sacred text, the sacred writings, my uh, whole vision was clouded about where we were going as indigenous people. I knew we had a great future, future. And I heard that from many elders that, you know, In the time of the end, like my grandmother talked about, she said, you know, we will help the world. That's going to be our job, she said. And she was not a Baha'i, but she was imbued with this, you know, inherent knowledge. And so in thinking about all of that, it wasn't until I started to read the sacred text that my ability to interpret different things in different art forms started to surface and I was um, you know as a writer as a storyteller I started to see all the spiritual components of these stories which a lot of people just thought were just like entertainment or you know people would pick up little different little uh, morals of the story but there's a deeper meaning to these stories but I wasn't able to hear them I wasn't able to embraced them until I started to read the sacred text because there is a power in these words of Baha'u'llah and it's the same with poetry I, and stories that I have written so that's the, the written form but also the courage um, I, I really felt that uh, I guess I must have been a Baha'i maybe four years yeah four years is when I started my whole Uh, artistic practice as a storyteller. Prior to that, I didn't really feel confident. I didn't feel that I had anything to share with the world, although I had many of these stories already, you know, implanted in my mind and, and in my memory. And I realized then that I be, I was a keeper of these stories. So the other thing is, is uh, just to be able to create things and, I've always been driven by this principle that my grandmother shared with me. She said, whatever you need, it's around you. So when I started to work in trying to make different things like crafts, textile work, you know, using with uh, making, making items with materials from the land, materials uh, that I was used to um, 
sewing with, you know, moose hide and, and bead work and just making these different things and baskets, birch bark baskets. I started to realize that in making them, I was uh, practicing uh, a unity. I'll, I'll give you a very quick example, okay, a birch bark basket. A birch bark basket consists of three things. There's the birch itself, and you have to know how to you have to know how to handle it. You have to know how to cut it. You have to know how to talk to it, really. And what's necessary to sew that birch together are the roots, the roots of the spruce tree. And when you approach the tree, the spruce tree, you have to approach it in a humble way. And you, most times people will put down matches or they put down some money or put down tobacco, you know, because you're thanking that tree because the tree is going to help you create something. And so there's the birch and then there's the willow that you use for stitching. And then you can put those things together and they come from two powerful trees. The birch, the beautiful birch. And then there's the, you know, the majestic spruce in which we get many of our medicines. We use the boughs for the, the flooring and tents. We use the pitch for medicine, for, for sores and things like this. We also can use some of the uh, bark and, and make um, boil it and make some tea, you know, if you're ill in some way. So those two trees are, are very um, tall and majestic. But what keeps that basket together is a small red willow. So this to me, and this is how I demonstrate it to children, when I make these baskets, I said, what we're talking about here is a unity and that everybody is is important to that unity so when we put the red willow around the little basket there it gives it strength so it doesn't collapse onto itself so that was that's just a little a short example of how i started to recognize in everything that i make is it has to first of all be beautiful you know, Baha'u'llah's name is the blessed beauty. So in everything, and if you, if you look with the eyes of the spirit out there to your materials, everything takes on a beautiful hue. It takes on beautiful color. And you see how formations, like if you look on the trees right now, I'm looking out at the branches, hoping that the buds will come out soon. You see how they all overlayer each other and some even shade each other. And those are the different hues of green that come out. So this is what I like to practice in my artwork. And the other thing that I discovered in the last couple of years, especially since we're starting to walk towards reconciliation, is I wanted to use my art to teach that necessity of mm. reconciliation. I'm actually really glad you brought this up. For our listeners, could you give a bit more of a background on what reconciliation means to you and to other Indigenous people in Canada? Children were actually taken from Indigenous families and put into schools, religious schools, residential schools. Some of them were taken for, from the time they were very little, from 6 to 18 that's a long time to be away from your parents. Some children that had roadways, like the, the children that were taken away for great lengths of periods of time were those that had to be flown back home. So all of these children were brought into a community of religious people into these residential schools. And they were not permitted to speak their language. They were not given their cultural teachings. They were taught the religion of whatever the church was that had the residential school, you could not associate with your brothers and sisters. You know, you were kind of separated out according to age. You definitely, if you were a girl, you could not go and talk to your brother. So these are things that happened. And with this Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was signed off as a document uh, three, four years ago now, 
by the government of Canada has, through a process of gathering many, many stories of survivors of these residential schools, and they would like the rest of Canada to now recognize that what they did was wrong. And they, the government of the day uh, asked for, they apologize. They didn't ask for forgiveness, they apologized. So part of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission's responsibility was to acquire those testimonies of how children were taught. So if you ever want to make a weak community, what you do, we've discovered, is to take away the children, not teach the children what they need to survive. And as one elder said, they cut our tongues out. We weren't allowed to speak the language. So therefore, they were not allowed to speak the language of the spirit of the people. So that's what went down. And through this process, I have learned that part of my responsibility anyway as a Baha'i is now we've come to that sacred line of reconciliation and this is a line between those people who have suffered so much and those people who did not even know that we were suffering. Many people did not know. So this is a time in history when we're getting together, discovering what happened, and then to go forward. How do we strengthen each other? How do we find a place of forgiveness? Or do we? How do we find them, help them to find peace in that? And it's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm, Absolutely. To commemorate the tragic stories that were documented in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the residential school survivors, you made a blanket that honors their stories. Could you describe this blanket to us and share the inspiration behind your creative interpretations of the steps towards reconciliation? Right. Right, I made um, I made a blanket, and it was a, a wonderful thing, you know, because I I I feel strongly, and I, I move with that in that kind of spiritual space uh, that things that I need will come, and I just have to keep my eyes open. It's kind of like I still have a hunter spirit, I guess. <laughs> I was walking by a rec center that was being torn down, and that rec center had had many artists. Um, you know, give courses and things like that there. And as I was walking by, I, I noticed in the big um, pile of dirt and everything, it looked like blankets and it looked like hand woven blankets. So I went there and there was three there. I pulled the three out. I couldn't believe that somebody would throw away a hand woven blanket. And on this blanket, I attached these, um, what I refer to as as dancers, they are little tufts, they're um, pieces of wool strung, like attached together with abalone shells. But at the very top were seven beautiful buttons. And I, uh, re- I enlightened those to the original teachings of all of the Indigenous people of the country. There's basically seven teachings. Some people call them the grandfather teachings. Some people call them the seven mountains. In the Baha'i faith, of course, we refer to them as the seven valleys. So I had those buttons mark the top of the blanket. And then the first two rows where they had these um, uh, tufts, I guess you would call them, of wool, um, was white. These were all uh, measured out equally and and sewed across for two rows of white. And around each of these little tufts were tied another piece of wool, which was red. And this was the beginning of the settlers coming to this country. And of course, there was a little bit of blood on their hands. That's what the little red tie was about. And then the next two rows were red. And around the red tufts were a piece of black wool. And it was during that period where there was so much pain. There was blood spilt. There was a lot of pain. A lot of, I suppose, unbelievable hurt and pain that was burning within the 
hearts of the indigenous people. To have their children taken away, their villages silenced of children's laughter. And, you know, their total inability to prevent that from happening. So that's the next two rows was the indigenous. The next row, two rows are the black. And they are two rows of black, but they have a little, they have a little wool of yellow around their neck. And this is a period of darkness. This is a period of extreme stress. Um, the period in which a lot of my people found themselves in. Um, not thinking about or not being capable of seeking out their spiritual destiny. Many of them turned to addictions. Many of them turned to violence. Uh, because they were not parented properly. You know, this is by the residential schools. There is a lot of uh, dark period for us in Canada. And then the last two rows are the yellow. And the yellow is, um, has a little red, has a little, sorry, a little white wool around it. But the black had the yellow because despite all of this dark period, that little piece of yellow represents a little thread of light, that spirit within us that nobody can take. That's what that represented. And then the next two rows, the next two rows for the yellow. That's when we're, we're coming now into the light. You see all this resurgence of language. You see this resurgence of culture. You see this resurgence of wanting to know how to live together on the land, off the land. You see this resurgence of wanting to be educated, restoring music, restoring beautiful dance, beautiful stories of our strengths and our past. That's what the yellow ones, the two rows of yellow represent. And the very bottom are all of these threads, these pieces of wool pulled together so that there's the black, the white, the yellow, and the red, so that we're working together. So that's the reconciliation. That's what that blanket is about. And in the spirit of reconciliation, you'd also created these spirit bowls made of caribou hide, mm -hmm. which were inspired by a tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah called the Seven Valleys. Could you walk us through these valleys and share how they inspired this work in light of your efforts towards reconciliation? I'm learning, as a lot of Baha'is are learning, how do we, how do we take that mystical journey? How do we take our, how do we begin to search out truth? How do we find, you know, our way in life? And uh, this is, um, so these bowls were very intriguing to me. And uh, so what I did is I, I crafted them. And um, they asked if I would submit something that was made from traditional materials. And I thought, wow, I can light these seven valleys. And I can utilize them so that maybe other people can also understand that we're always in some valley we're always beginning to climb some mountain you know so the first valley of course is the valley of search and the valley of this love that we have when we do when we begin to search and when we move into knowledge and we move into this wonderment you know wondering why we didn't know this before and then moving into contentment and then the last one is just so amazing that you would move into, you know, absolute poverty and nothingness. So I use this as the seven bulls towards reconciliation. Because when we search out our own hearts and our own minds, what we do want is to not have any barriers between you and another human being because of somebody else's decisions. And so that was the main message that I was able to take them 
beautiful teachings of Baha'u'llah and the Seven Valleys and and um, have that in a public exhibition. Beautiful. And I think we'll be able to share some of the photographs of this exhibition on our website. Sadly, it's time for us to bring this interview to a close. But before you go, I just want to ask you one final question. What is your hope for the Indigenous peoples of Canada and the world? My prayer, my prayer is that everyone will take their their rightful place in leading the world to where we're going. And that's going to be done with all the nations of the world. But I think that, and Abdul Baha speaks about that. He said the indigenous people, once they are educated, that they will lead the world to a better place. This is what, that's my hope for my people. Beautiful words to end by Louise. Thank you so much for taking us on this inspiring journey of pain, hope, and resilience as we walk along this path together toward reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Baha'iTeachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles.